As promised in my review of the UA Volt 2, today we're going to check out the Universal Audio Volt 276 and do a little comparison between the two. Hey, Julian Kraus here, and we all know why you're here. Built-in compression. That's one of the features that the Volt 276 sets itself apart from other interfaces. And of course, I'll let you listen to some audio samples later. To start out, let's have a look at the hardware first and then dive a bit deeper into the audio quality. The first thing you notice when looking at the Volt 276 is its design with the two wooden panels on its side. Yes, those are made out of real wood and give the interface a bit of an organic look. On the Volt 276 you will find most of the controls on the top. There you have two knobs to control the gain of the two inputs. For each channel you also get a button to toggle the vintage mode and compressor settings, which I will go over in more detail later. You can also find a big knob to control the volume of your main outputs and a button to toggle the direct monitoring mode. This provides three functions. You can either have it off, set to stereo or mono. On the top right you can also find level meters for the in and output. While I would still like to see a more granular meter, this is already quite a bit more useful compared to the two LEDs you get on the Volt 2 and I would actually be able to set my gain with these. On the front of the interface you can find two XLR and TRS inputs and the corresponding buttons to switch between line level and instrument input. There is also a button for phantom power, which toggles the 48 volts for both inputs simultaneously. Quick side note, like on the Volt 2, when turning off and on phantom power, the LED is blinking, the inputs are muted and the voltage is slowly ramped up and down. That's a very gentle way of switching phantom power and also ensures that you do not hear any clicks and pops in the process. On the front you can also find a knob to control the headphone volume and of course a quarter inch headphone jack. On the back of the interface you got a switch to turn on and off the interface, which I really like. The 5V DC connector is used when the device connected to the interface does not deliver enough power via USB, which is often the case for mobile devices. In most cases you will be able to simply connect the interface via the USB-C connection and all the necessary cables are included. You also get two MIDI connections, one in and one output, and last but not least two TRS balanced line level outputs. The build quality is quite nice, the knobs turn smoothly, the housing is made out of solid metal and even under the wooden covers you will find a metal plate for shielding. While I'll already have the interface apart, let's have a quick look inside. We can find similar components to the Volt 2 and I'm not surprised to find the same AD-DA converter, a Cirrus Logic CS4272. As I mentioned, this converter can provide a good audio quality, but it is getting a bit old now and especially in an interface in the 276's price range, I would have liked to see maybe a bit more premium audio conversion. But again, the best converter is worth nothing if it's badly implemented. So let's see how the 276 really performs with some measurements. So all in all, the build quality is really good and I kinda like the retro look of the Volt 276. Now let's check out the performance of the mic inputs starting with the frequency response. This is at the maximum gain setting and here you can see some roll off in the higher and lower frequencies. I'm not surprised, at the max gain setting this is something I see regularly in interfaces. As the roll off is just on the edge of human hearing, I don't think that you will ever notice this in practice. But I would have definitely liked to see a flatter response here. Speaking of which, when you don't max out the gain, the response is actually very flat, showing only a negligible roll-off in the lower frequencies. Because of the maximum sample rate of 192 kHz, the response can extend even above the human hearing range and only rolls off at 75,000 Hz. One more spec that's important is the dynamic range. With a high dynamic range you can leave yourself more headroom while recording without introducing any additional noise. I measured the dynamic range of the mic input and it comes out at 118.8 dBA. That's virtually the same performance as the Volt 2 and for all intents and purposes I will rank them the same. So it's no wonder that the distortion performance is also identical to the Volt 2. With a typical microphone level signal you get a steadily descending line of THD plus N which means that all distortion components sit below the noise floor. Swept over the frequency range you can see that this also stays very low, which is nice to see and goes to show that you can get clean recordings with the 276. It's preamp performance time and you know what that means. I'm talking into a Shure SM7B and let you listen to the noise floor. The SM7B has a ridiculously low sensitivity, which is a worst case scenario for the preamp. And this is what the noise floor sounds like.
This is a very low noise floor and this again is not surprising as the measured equivalent input noise comes in at minus 129 dBUA weighted, which is very low noise. And here you can compare to other interfaces. I know I repeat myself, but you don't need a Cloudlifter Fathead or DM1 with the Vault 276. The preamps are already low noise enough, so that there's little to no benefit in buying such an inline preamp. Spoiler, the vintage mode is the exact same you also find on the Vault 2. It changes the frequency response and adds just a small amount of distortion. If you want to hear what the vintage mode sounds like, you can head over to my previous video and have a listen to the audio samples. By the way, I'll plan to compare the Vintage mode with the Focusrite's Air mode and the SSL's 4K mode, so subscribe if you don't want to miss that video. For now, let's focus on the 76 style compressor and I'll play some audio samples with and without compression. There is a theory which states that if ever anyone discovers exactly what the universe is for and why it is here, it will instantly disappear and be replaced by something even more bizarre and inexplicable. There's another theory which states that this has already happened. According to UA, this is based on an 1176 limiting amplifier, and as the name implies, this is not only a compressor, but also a limiter. And we can actually see this behavior in my measurements. Here you can see the linearity of the interface's input with the compressor turned off. This is just a straight line as we would expect. When you turn on the compressor, you will notice that everything gets quite a bit louder, and in fact the raised line shows that the compressor adds 7 decibels of gain. You can also see that the compression only really sets in above minus 12 dBFS. And in fact you need your signal to be going above that to get any compression at all. And that's not always that easy to judge when the compressor is on. So the way I actually recommend to set this up is to set your level with the compressor turned off. Set your gain so that you peak around minus 18 to minus 12 dB. Then turn on the compressor which will boost your signal by 7 decibels and at this point your peaks will be gently hitting the limiter. If you want more or less compression, you can simply adjust your gain from there. Now you could hear that the different compression settings sound different, but what exactly is their difference when the compression curve is the same? Well, it's all about how the compressor handles attack and release. With the vocal and guitar setting you get about a 3 to 6 millisecond attack and a 1 to 2 seconds release time. These times change slightly depending on how hard the signal hits the compressor. You might have noticed that these times are the same, and the attack is actually identical, but the curve of the release is different. The vocal setting has a more gradual release, whereas the guitar setting initially releases a bit faster, but then the release slows down. So the guitar setting is a bit snappier on the release, and the vocal setting a bit slower, like it is often the case with a leveling compressor. The fast setting is noticeably different from the other two settings. It has a near instant attack time of less than 0.5 milliseconds and a quick release of about 100 to 200 milliseconds, which also quickly restores when the level falls below the threshold before it gently rolls out. One thing I noticed is that the compressor has a negative impact on the dynamic range. I'm not sure if this is intentional or not, but the mic input's dynamic range of around 112 dB drops to only 88.6 dBA. So in recordings with the compressor engaged you might start to notice some noise, especially if you then go ahead and compress the recording even more in post. I'll just flip through the graphs for the line level inputs as their performance is virtually identical to the mic inputs. And I will also keep the output side relatively short because, surprise surprise, the audio performance of the Volt 276 is the same as the Volt 2. So I'll only glance over some more interesting topics 
And if you want to get more information, especially for the output performance, you can check out my previous review of the Vault 2, which if I've done my job correctly, should pop up on the screen now. Like the Vault 2, the 276 has an exceptionally flat frequency response of the main output. It also shows inaudible amounts of distortion and a decent output level. And now here's the correct graph, which shows the dynamic range of the 276's output, which also looks quite good. One thing I want to mention is that the Volt 276 and the Volt 2 have a fully symmetrical output, which again shows the attention to detail on the Volt series. Next up, headphone output performance. I have already mentioned that the Volt 2 has quite a bit of power output, which is nice to see as this means that you can drive your headphones to a loud listening level. And this statement is exactly the same for the Volt 276. The Volt 2 had a slight channel imbalance, which I could also preserve on the 276. So one channel was about 1.1 dB louder than the other one. This isn't really noticeable in practice, but it would have been nice to see a better channel balance here. And lastly, I want to make a small correction. The crosstalk figure is actually a bit higher than stated in the Vault 2 review, as this seemed to be a measurement mistake. Regardless, the crosstalk is still quite low, so the Vault 276 and the Vault 2 give you a nice stereo separation. So all in all, the headphone output is quite nice, as it has low distortion and enough power to drive the majority of headphones on the market. Before I can wrap up this video, I quickly want to talk about the driver and latencies, as I did a bit more testing and found out some additional things. One thing is sadly still the same, and that's that you need to register to download the ASIO driver, which I personally think is unfortunate, to put it politely. Lastly, here you can find my measured round trip latencies, and the times are definitely a bit longer than on other interfaces I've measured in this class. The reported times in the ASIO driver also do not line up with the measured times when the interface is running with a sample rate of 48 kHz. This might lead to problems when your DAW tries to compensate for the RTL with the reported ASIO times, as this compensation will be off by about 2 milliseconds. Probably not a huge deal, but it would be nice to see the corrected times in the ASIO control panel, and I have already reported this to Universal Audio. One thing you can also see is that with higher sample rates, the latency is a bit lower. So if latency is critical for you, I would suggest to try out a higher sample rate. So there you have it. The Volt 276 is essentially a Volt 2 with an additional compressor and slightly different design. Other than that, the audio performance is virtually identical. So my verdict is quite similar to the Volt 2. The Volt 276 is not the highest performing interface on the market, but it excels at consistently good measurements all around, which goes to show that the Volt 276 is well designed. The preamps are very low noise, the mic inputs deliver a very nice amount of dynamic range, and distortion is kept to an inaudible amount. This is not only true for the inputs, but also for the outputs as well. The line level output provides a solid line level signal, and the headphone output delivers enough power to drive the majority of headphones on the market. On top of that, you also get a vintage mode, which adds a bit of subtle coloration to your audio. Now let's address the elephant in the room. Is the Volt 276 worth $100 more compared to the Volt 2 when they have the exact same audio performance? Well, the design is a bit different, which could sway you in one direction or the other, but what it realistically comes down to is the question if you want to have the built-in compression effects. On one hand, it can be quite nice to have these effects directly built into your interface and being able to use them while recording without any monitoring delay. But then again, with the built-in compressor, you can only use the three presets and have no further control over things like ratio, attack and release times. So in the end, it's about convenience here. And you have to decide whether having the compressor available with a simple push of a button is worth the extra cost for you. Please give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and subscribe for more videos like this. I will see you all in the next one.